Hello, uh, what I want to do today is talk to you about or at least give you an overview of forest management and in regards to particularly one thing that's discussed all across this country and that's AAC, Annual Allowable Cut. In this video, what I want to do is just talk about initially the most basic and simplistic approach which is called area based approach and this approach uh, will be the first one and then the following uh, video will discuss the volume based approach a little more tricky but still it's not overwhelmingly difficult to understand so let, let's go through this video and we will get a better understanding of how AAC annual allowable cut is calculated generally across the entire country. First of all, let's take a look at sustainable forestry. That has been, over the years, that definition or term has certainly changed and there's been many definitions uh, provided for what is sustainable forestry and there's probably one definition for every person out there but let's get into the right into it and let's talk what is maintaining a forest forever that's what we want and that's what society wants so when you look at a, de a more generic definition this is quite a mouthful but this we look at it it's the most efficient use of natural resource of a natural resource on a sustained basis without minimizing the use of other natural resources or diminishing the quality of the ecosystem wow there's a whole pile of stuff so let's look break this all down the most efficient use in other words uh, the least cost approach is what it's meant by that of a natural resource, so that does not extend not this does not just pertain to forest but to other natural resources. And um, but on a sustained basis, okay, without minimizing the use of other natural resources. So for example, no, uh, if one of the natural resources is game for hunting, so without minimizing moose habitat deer habitat and so on okay and also tied to that would be at the same time about diminishing the ecosystem in other words anything we do will not have long-term damage to that ecosystem so that's one definition and it certainly is a great one to follow now from a if you were going to look at this definition in respect to wood fiber Okay, so in regards to wood fiber, what are we looking at? Uh, if we're going to extract wood, which is a reality, we're going to extract wood from a uh, forest, that's part of forestry, how do we do that? Well, first of all, <clears throat> let's just read the definition. The most efficient sustained production of specific sized trees, volume and or size, about depleting the growing stock of the forest or lowering the quality of the forest ecosystem. So let's go again through this definition which has a lot in it packed in there. So again it's the most efficient way of getting wood out uh, from the forest, from the trees, from the, excuse me, from the stands, forest stands, and of specific sized trees. Now that does not just mean a big tree. It could mean trees that have lots of volume. Because a lot of black, black spruce are small, but they provide a lot of volume for the pulping industry, or poplar could be volume. Or they could be a specific size. Let's say we want all our white pine of a certain size to provide us with dimensional lumber or whatever the case may be, flooring or uh, siding and so on. <clears throat> now the next part comes about depleting the growing stock. People go what the heck is this growing stock? 
<clears throat> what the growing stock implies is the the forest capital that we have. In other words, if you're going to look at it, let's say we all wish we could win a hundred million dollars. Used to be a million, but now we got to say a hundred million dollars. Then everyone says, "Well, what would you do with the money?" And people instinctively say, "I would live off the interest." Well, because the capital or the growing stock is what you want to maintain and that's exactly what we say in the forest to we want to leave the forest in such a manner that we always have ample forest in the future uh, otherwise if we cut too much or get into our take too much of our lotto winnings we end up with less and less interest in the future which would diminish uh, our forest in this example okay so and another big part is, of course, we want to do all that without lowering the quality of the forest. You know, because you know, it, I've seen this happen. People say, "Oh, look, uh, we've cut all these trees, and now there's more trees coming back. So what's the big deal?" Yeah, if you cut a whole bunch of beautiful white pine uh, in a region and large beautiful oaks, and then all you have come back is uh, let's say pin cherry and poplar some white birch balsam fir yes there's a forest coming back but what you have done is you have lowered the quality of the forest ecosystem okay so that's not uh, allowable under the crown forest sustainability act which we'll talk about in later lectures so so really, if you want to boil it down to one thing, eh, it's trees forever. And that's and the way you do that is you ensure no overcutting is done in the long run. And that's what it's all about. So how do you do that? Well, you have an annual allowable cut. <clears throat> and uh, the big question always is, is this enough? Just make, is making sure you have enough a forest forever. If only thing we cared about was, and the only thing we cared about was getting trees out, then it would be enough. But we have to think about all kinds of things, which is I'm pleased to hear the wildlife, the soils, the longevity for uh, all the other elements of a forest ecosystem. It is not just about the trees. And there sh uh, shall be again. So, to do this, we need we need a, uh, an approach that deals with on a sustainable basis. On a sustainable basis, how we use this concept of area. So, here we go. Required. So this requires the following. Okay. So the whole idea is you extract a constant amount constant amount each year from the forest and that's again like back to this example of you winning a hundred million dollars living off the interest it is the growth in the forest we're going to live off in other words the forest grows let's say one meter cube uh, per year then in 80 years you would have 80 meters cubed from that one tree so the idea is we're living off the interest and then we must ensure if this is going to work that we have constant consistent reforestation remember and please note the word I use reforestation too many in the public think reforestation equals planting it's not the case reforestation means returning a forest uh, returning a harvested area back to a quality forest that could be natural seeding, it could be aerial seeding, it could be planting, and so on, so on. The next one is we have to make sure the same amount of area represented by each age class in the forest. And I will provide some examples. In other words, the best analogy I can always consider is pretend you have a 10, you've just got 10 acres, 10 hectares of land and you want to grow Christmas trees. Some people I've seen, what they do is they plant the whole area 
with Christmas trees the first year they own it. So they, it's great. After 10 years, they have Christmas trees. They have a huge harvest of Christmas trees 10 years later. And then they have nothing for the, the next 10 years until they plant again the area and the forest returns. A more sensible way is to have a sustainable yield. So you have an equal, you would put one hectare of this land, of this uh, 10 hectares, into Christmas trees each year. So you first 10 years, you plant only one hectare per year. So then you would have a staggered age class of from one to 10 years in your forest. And so whatever you harvest, that one hectare you harvest in the 10th year would be reforested. Uh, in that year also or in the spring so the result is you'd have a sustainable yield of Christmas trees and the saying goes we try to use that approach a little more complex but that gives you the idea how it works in a forest okay the um, so what are the advantages of this well like the Christmas tree analogy I just gave to you use uh, which you certainly have is that you have a constant supply of wood. You have a nice diversity of age classes, 1 to 20, 21 to uh, 40, and so on, nicely spread out. But they are limited. They don't go past the harvest age, which we'll talk about later. And it's very predictable. You know how much you're going to get in the future uh, because you know your wood supply is constant. Now let's get a, let's just get a little bit of touch of reality of what really happens also with some of the challenges. No forest is this balanced in age classes. Traditionally in Canada, across all our provinces, you will find that most of the forests are on the older side. Uh, maybe not so much in the Maritimes right now, but generally Ontario and West. Our forests have a lot of older age classes which go well beyond the time you would harvest them. And this has created a lot of grief for us, mountain pine beetle, you know, really good fires and so on. So, and then the other challenge is to have these, you know, you know equal age classes all the way up to the time of uh, harvest. It's difficult to avoid fluctuations. For example, uh, you could have very common course things are like fire, insects, and disease, and other uses of the forest can influence how much you have. So it's like having your lotto winnings, and suddenly you find, uh, I don't know, someone robbed the bank and took away $10 million from your account. Now you have to rejuggle your finances and live off this new interest. So this is the challenge in the real world. So then the next thing is that there are two approaches for doing this and the uh, one approach I'm going to discuss now, uh, so there are two approaches, the one we're going to discuss and give you the ideas for is called even aged, even aged management and so basically you divide the forest or the same uh, species type into equal areas and then uh, for harvest per year. So let's go through some examples. Next week, what I want, uh, excuse me, the next video, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to chat about uneven age management in another video. Okay, and so you'll have that. So now, um, so even age management is mainly used in the boreal forest because that's where we have tree species. Uh, found which are uh, generally intolerant and they do well when you open them up with um, uh, an exposed maximum of sunlight to the forest floor uh, so as it says right here okay so we focus on intolerant intolerant uh, to shade species for jack pine aspen lodgepole pine so on and the areas are harvested under the clear-cut system or the shelter wood and next semester we'll talk about these two harvesting systems in detail but just to give you an idea the clear cuts are not so clear cut anymore they are uh, if you remember from camp there 
there's a lot of things left in, in the clear cuts. It is not just mowing down everything. It's totally illusionary if that was considered. So if we we're going to look at this example, here you can see we have a for this is an imaginary forest I've created. And here you can see the forest. Uh, let's look at the axes of this dia graph. And we have forests from 1 to 20 years old. Remember in forest we break it out in 20 year age classes. 21 to 40, 41 to 60, and 61 to 80. And if the forest hits 81, we harvest it. And then the right of way, we take it back to here and we plant it, right? And then it becomes one year old the next year. So let's pretend in our little forest that we have this here is hectares, okay? These are hectares. Uh, we have 250 hectares, okay? Located in the one to 20 year age group and then we have 250 hectares in the 20 on the 40 and so on. And we harvest every time at 81 and nothing ever eats our trees and so we have a very continuous supply. This is called a balanced age class. You will also hear it called normalization of a forest. A fancy term, but that's what all they're trying to say is when you hear the term normalization, it means a forest which has these equal age classes across um, the entire uh, age span. So how do you calculate the number, uh, the amount of forest to harvest? Well, you got to find a total area. You need to find a total area of the forest for a specific working group. You mean what the heck is a working group? A working group implies a certain species and how you will manage it. So for example, poplar working group would be managed different than a black spruce working group. It is a term used in Ontario, so just get used to that unusual term, but it is there. It implies how you're going to manage uh, silviculturally that group. So let's say, let's pretend we got a thousand hectares of jack pine, okay, and they all look like this. So what you do is you decide on the rotation age, and this is uh, always d depending on what are you growing. If it's a shorter rotation, uh, like for pulp, that, that's what you'd have for, let's say, six year rotation for pulp. And if you're going to have a longer rotation, you would, uh, uh, let's say, 80 years, 90 years, you're trying to produce saw logs in that area, make bigger, fewer, but bigger trees. And here's just some examples of uh, rotations jack pine pulp at 55 years, saw logs at 80. Black spruce, a slower growing tree, is pulp at maybe at 85. And hardwood saw logs could be as old as 100 years. So, first of all, so you need to find out how much area you have of a particular species and what rotation age do you want to grow them at. Okay? So, the next thing is all you do is, and it's not too intimidating is to calculate you have this little formula and all you do is you take the total area of, of the uh, forest okay and if you look at our example down here take the total area of the forest and then and then take and divide the rotation into that so there you go so we have a thousand hectares of jack pine of all ages out there in our forest and we want to grow that those jack pines working group to 80 years of age for okay so therefore our annual allowable cut for that jack pine forest would be 12 and a half hectares per year or 250 hectares each 20 years like the graph shows okay so that gives you an idea and I have a star here by the way uh, total air of a working group Black spruce would be, for example, broken out into two areas. Upland black spruce, which grows way quicker than lowland black spruce in the swamp, in the wetland.
Okay, so therefore, the 80 year old piece of forest harvested in the first year of extraction will be again available for harvest in 80 years' time. So that's basically, and that's how we used to consider. I mean, we'd say we'd slap each other on the back, say that's a great job, that's all we need to do to call sustainable forestry. And that's not so. There's a lot more to forestry than that. Okay. So, um, points to consider. To ensure sustainable forest yields over time, a constant on land base must be considered. What fa uh, and what factors influence the available land base? Well, for example, if uh, it's a pressure of the other users, if the nothing against parks, but if suddenly a park is, uh, is developed where you're trying to manage your forest under annual allowable cut, then you have some of your capital uh, removed, so now it's more difficult, or if there are other restrictions, or if there's a fire, and it goes on and on. So most one of the most interesting ones I find is how does this question here, what kind of problem can overcutting create in the future when one looks at balanced age classes? A lot of people think that overcutting is just a problem for that when it happened, but it's actually a problem that just will haunt the forest for years to come. Let's look at this little example I have here. Let's assume that a forest annual level cut over 20 years is 250 hectares. So every 20 years the, they cut 250 hectares of land. Now someone gets a little greedy or who knows why cuts 350 hectares in 20 years so they've overcut by a hundred hectares. So the red here that you see it shows that. So they've cut this is okay they cut all that that was fine but the problem was that then the person cut this extra little piece here from the next age class. So then you go, well, what's the big deal? So what happens is the forest now changes. Okay, we'll still assume that they're planting, but now what happens 20 years later, you have a large amount of forest that requires regeneration. Okay, so you, and uh, so you have a large amount of forest that needs re regeneration, and you can see it here. So now you've got an extra 100 hectares. The available wood supply of mature timber is uh, in the 61 to 80 class is now only 100 because they, they took out more. Okay, So now you have a diminished amount of forest. Um, okay. They've removed that extra amount, so technically you only have this amount to cut, right? So you have less hard to harvest, and, and the, okay, and you have more trees you have to plant. Or you do the, you know, you get into a vicious cycle, so you start cutting younger trees to account for the loss of volume there. So you can see how rapidly overcutting can spiral into a real demise of a forest. So that's what we have to be careful of. So how do provinces calculate uh, AAC? Well, they do inventories. Okay, uh, they study growth rates of trees using permanent growth plots uh, or permanent sample plots. Okay, they divide the forest into areas which they call uh, sustainable forest licenses in Ontario, so that the forests are managed sustainable based on only a certain uh, forest, not an entire province uh, as one. They use computer models to predict how forests are going to grow. It is a complex thing. They have to make quite a few assumptions on how trees grow. We do not have all the facts. So there's all discussions how fast do trees grow, for example, which are a little more spaced out on drier sites, uh, let's say jack pine, compared to uh, you know mid slope or whatever. So they have is it's always trying to figure that out is what are the assumptions and the big one is what do you want to grow boy that's a tough one because you're asking someone okay what do you want what, what do you want to grow here and remember you're going to have this product available in 70 years wow and the way this world's changing who knows 
And what are the constraints in regards to the land base uh, markets that are currently available for different products and so on? So just a quick one here. So you can see here how the, the entire province is broken into different uh, sustainable forest licenses and if you can't remember this this here is the Algonquin Forestry Authority license and this is the Nipissing one this is the one we were this is where we were doing actually the cutting right where the end of the arrow is almost we were working for the Nipissing Forest Management uh, SFL so that's a fairly large one you can see but there are many this is a little dated and some of them have merged together and changed a bit so it's just to give you the idea how it is very much broken up into these SFLs so we can better manage the forest resource in Ontario. Of course there are no SFLs down here because it is, it is very much private land so it's not worthwhile of, of considering. The lowest one you'll see is the uh, Ottawa Valley one and the Bancroft region. Uh, in this little chart, what I want to just give you the magnitude of um, the annual. See here, I wanted to just give you an idea of how the term is used. Regulated harvest, allowable annual cut. And this is out of the National Forestry Database. It's just so you get an idea that the, this term is used in different places. Okay, and, uh, and you can see that on provincial crown land a lot more softwood is cut than there is hardwood and hardwood implies generally pulp I mean a uh, poplar excuse me generally my poplar Ugh, hardly talk this is to show you that over the last and this is a bit dated but the data always comes out later for the year so I mean later years because um, it takes a while to compile all this information but one striking fact is that since 2004 and and, the, uh, and with the collapse of the uh, American economy more or less that we've had generally you can see here the trend the amount of hectares of harvested uh, uh, of forests uh, across Ontario has diminished over the uh, years and it's pretty it's starting to level out uh, this year, but it is still a significant difference as compared to the heyday. So I just wanted to show you that. And this is for all of Ontario. Uh, the wood volumes. This is a fascinating graph to show because a lot of people think the only thing that's going on out there is, uh, uh, for example, a losses or a heart due to harvest. And if you look at, first of all, each one of these uh, here imply a year, and then you can see the year over here. So, you know, this is 2004 to 5 and so on, and it goes up to 2009. So this here is showing you how much harvest occurred, and again, you can see how the harvest has declined over time. And we've been very fortunate in the province that the insect significance has been very low over those years but the disease uh, has certainly increased. I can't speak exactly for which diseases um, that escapes me right now uh, sorry uh, but here is a fascinating one is weather and you can see how se severe windstorms really created a lot of la damage in, uh, of, in our forested lands and wildfire it always goes up and down but fire can always be a, a real detriment like this year we've had significant fires around Timmins 2012 which really created about a loss of one year's cut so it was quite significant okay and um, so in Ontario one thing to consider is that the annual allowable cut is calculated every five years we use the term AHA, the available harvest area, and that means 
what areas can a harvest company cut so this excludes uh, the buffer zones park areas so you get a real perspective of what's really available so like kind of if you want to understand that one imagine you get a paycheck for I don't know thousand bucks over a couple of weeks or a week and then you go wow I have a thousand dollars available for me no you don't you have taxes and who knows what other uh, deductions so the available money you have a Actually, it's like saying in a force, the AHA, after all the deductions are taken out, here's what actually, out of let's say 300,000 hectares of forest, there may be only 150,000 hectares of forest where you can actually harvest merchantable trees. Okay, so that's what AHA stands for. Uh, there is a downward trend in the annual allowable cut, and you've seen the graphs, and a couple of things that attribute to that is the um, as we consider biodiversity species at risk habitat old growth and new management guidelines it has reduced areas that are AHA uh, change in land use Ontario living legacy is an areas that were um, uh, set aside which are excluded for forest harvesting and would also affect the annual allowable cut for the province and of course the downturn of the uh, US market still has a, an effect on us. The very uh, here I just wanted to point out this is who cares about exactly what year but what's important here is you get to see where is most of the wood cut and I have it circled here and this is, these are the two big players as far as softwood species go White pine may be the tree of Ontario, but it is very insignificant in the amount of volume. You can see that jack pine and spruce, especially spruce, almost double that of jack pine, is what we harvest in Ontario for pulp and paper and for lumber. Okay, The big player for uh, the hardwood species always will be poplar. Okay, And, and poplar is per, pretty well populous tremuloides. And this is all about uh, trees which go for a wafer board, pulp, and uh, panel products. So those are the big players. And the rest of the trees are quite insignificant. The next biggest one really here is white birch. Right? Um, you know, for all the talk about maple, you can see maple is almost tied with birch to be fair. Okay. Uh, but after that it's really really insignificant and you can see even though the ash a lot of the ash are dying and it's horrible they are not a huge contributor to our economy it will not be the collapse of the Ontario economy so finally softwood and hardwood volumes are harvested you can see in Sun Thunder Bay area the northwest region you can as it's mostly softwood and the and the, and then we have uh, uh, this represents poplar right you can see here the northeast area Timmins and that type of area we've got a lot of black spruce jack pine and again it's about the same amount of poplar and in southern Ontario where we're getting uh, we certainly it's mostly it's in a real mixed bag of uh, Oh, maple, birch, uh, and poplar. Okay, and not as and very and this is probably more dedicated to white pine. Okay, so it just gives this will give you an overview of annual allowable cuts and some of the magnitude and where or how do we look at, look at those um, terms in regards to forestry in Ontario. Thank you.